I'd say my top tip for dealing with the very hot weather is not bung four gobby broadcasters into a tiny <laughs> studio and make them sit really close together. Especially when we're so hot anyway. Well, there's yes. definitely that, yeah. Sizzling. And Nina, welcome to Newscast. Thank you, lovely you to be here. the BBC breakfast business kind of, you do it on a sort of stage, don't you? Sort of, but I'm more kind of hard hat, high vis, PPE, wandering around farms and factories type of correspondent, yeah. but a little bit of the... Um, in fact, the last time I saw Chris was on the red sofa. That's right, about, what, about five, six weeks ago. There's all this speculation yeah. about who oh. might be the BBC's new political editor and the pictures <laughs> of Chris who was in the it paper. In the was so it how did end? that work yeah. out? It was in the newspapers. Yeah, I remember you threatening to say, well, I wonder if we, maybe we show this page. A page. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 let's not do that. I did take a photo of Chris kind of panicking as I tried to put <laughs> something on Twitter. But um, Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Um, anyway, do you have any tips for keeping cool in such hot weather? Stay indoors. Yeah, I mean, that's an evergreen one, really, isn't it? I actually think that is the official government advice, isn't is it? it? Is Don't it? Don't go out in the heat, <laughs> is the advice. My solution is go to Anglesey for any questions where it's going to be <laughs> drizzle and a fresh breeze. <laughs> highs, of, highs of 19 degrees, which is just right for me. As soon as I get into the 20s, bit hot, bit hot. Which Never is weird, because when you look at the weather map for tomorrow, I mean, oh, yeah. it is bright red and orange for most of the country. And like in London, it's going to be 33. In Hull, it's going to be 29. In Norwich, it's going to be 32. You and see, yeah, actually, you do see Anglesey is yeah. Yeah, not in the red mm. zone. And you see where I'll be returning to this evening, where it all goes to a much weaker colour. By the way, thanks for these graphics. You've really gone to town. <laughs> um, no expense, but that's what I'm used to. It will. I can guarantee as soon as I pass crew on the train, the heavens will open, which is why, even though I looked at the weather forecast coming down to London, I came mm. with a cagoule, oh, oh. a woolly jumper. <laughs> Oh. And I've got my sandals on, but I've also got a spare pair of trainers in my bag as well. A pair the of wellies. So the, uh, scared. The mics have arrived. <laughs> what do you think was going to happen on this podcast? I just, honestly, I've got a pathological fear of being cold. And maybe it's doing all those outside broadcasts, or maybe it's growing up in Manchester, but I never leave home without okay. a cagoule. Well, that's enough for Weathercast. Let's get on with this episode of Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Adam in the studio. And Vicky in the studio. Nina in the studio. And Chris in the studio. And I should probably just accept I am growing a moustache because I didn't mention <laughs> it last week. Didn't you? No, it just sort of unfolded. Yet another oh. benefit of listening on BBC Sounds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How's that? Still sound the same, still sound the same. <laughs> you got a bit oh, sweaty in the heat. Really sweaty. <laughs> you do, you, yeah, my tip is don't grow a moustache during it. A pre-heat wave. Anyway, right, that's enough about me. Um, or ever. New, the news, more has emerged about the resignation of Lord Geit, who was the Prime Minister's independent advisor on the ministerial code. Now, Vicky, you've been following the story today on the news and we've learned a lot more about what was going on, we think. So we'll come to that in a second. But Chris, just first of all, for people who, who the ministerial code is not an important part of their life, like it is for us, I don't know if you carry a copy around in your in your briefcase, maybe. It's about my person, um, yeah. Why is it such an important thing, the Ministerial Code, and what does the independent advisor kind of do? Why are they such an important figure? Well, it matters because it kind of sets out the, the rules, the conventions about how ministers, including the Prime Minister, should go about their job. And it overseen by an independent advisor who looks at, when asked by the Prime Minister, the behaviour of a particular minister to determine whether or not they're in breach of that code. But ultimately, it comes back to the Prime Minister to determine whether or not someone remains in office or not. And that really gets to the heart of all of these tensions, not least because in the essence of the exchanges that we've seen between the outgoing uh, standards ethics advisor and the prime minister, needless to say, he was rather the advisor, rather keen on the importance of the ministerial code. And it's his view was that the prime minister was much less so. And we saw that at the end of May, when the when uh, uh, we saw that Lord Guy really didn't like the idea that the Prime Minister hadn't outwardly until that point said that the ministerial code mattered, and in his view, Boris Johnson's view, he hadn't breached it when he was fined on over the whole Partygate thing. And we've seen it in these letters of in these exchanges of letters following Lord Guy's resignation. Yeah, and that's the thing that's happened today because Vicky, when we were doing the last episode of Newscast, uh, which is available on BBC Sounds, the news broke in the middle of us having a chat about something else, and we both were just like, whoa and stopped talking about that and started talking about this. And then, as Chris was saying, today we got the release of the letters that went between Lord Guite resigning and Boris Johnson saying, OK, thanks, bye. Um, and th this is where we've learned about a bit more about what was going on. So if you look at Lord Guite's letter, he says, 
I was tasked to offer a view about the government's intention to consider measures which risk a deliberate and purposeful breach of the ministerial code. This request has placed me in an impossible and odious position. What do we know about what the government's intention was? Well, this is what's so strange, because when we talked last night, we said, well, what has happened between him giving evidence to those MPs where he was asked about resigning? What's happened between that and now? And although we have a little bit more of a clue, it's not entirely clear, but it does seem to be about a trade issue. It seems to be about the government's desire to basically extend tariffs on, we think, but we don't know for sure, steel imports to protect British industry. Uh, now, the question is, does that potentially break international rules, trade rules? Uh, and if it does, is that breaking potentially the ministerial code or not? So it's a slightly odd one, actually, probably not the answer we would have come up with no. when we discussed it yesterday, because, of course, the other things have all been a bit easier to understand about the Prime Minister's behaviour. There's also a discrepancy between... What, what he, Lord Guite, is saying in this letter about what were the government's, to an extent, preordained intentions around all of this and what those in number 10 are saying, where they're saying, no, we merely asked for his guidance on something that we are contemplating. And there's clearly a sense from some in number 10 that they feel he was looking for a pretext to resign, having... 24 hours previously, he said to the Prime Minister he wanted to carry on until at least Christmas. Well, and let's see what Boris Johnson's letter to Lord Guite then said, because there's a hint of that there. He wrote, You say that you were put in an impossible position regarding my seeking your advice on potential future decisions relating to the Trade Remedies Authority. That's the clue that it's to do about tariffs on imports of Chinese steel. And then the PM goes on, My intention was to seek your advice on the national interest in protecting a crucial industry. And then there's a later bit in the letter where he sort of hints that maybe Lord Guite was finding the pressure of the job a little bit too much. So that's... The problem is because whatever conversation they may or may not have had, and because we weren't in the room and we don't know about that, you just don't know what it is still that actually prompted mm. Lord Guite to go finally. Because if it's the case he was simply asked his advice, well, why would that prompt you to leave unless you thought that maybe your advice... Might be ignored. And actually, it's more of a sort of straw that broke the camel's back sort of say, thing. Yeah. He says in the letter that he was hanging on by a margin, wasn't he? So it was maybe just the last thing. Nina, as a say. business journalist, it must yeah. be great seeing the Trade Remedies Authority <laughs> oh, name yeah, up in well, lights. I knew all about it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in terms of what the government's been saying about it today, we've got the letter from the Prime Minister and it was Simon Clark, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who's been on newscast a few times, who had to front up to the cameras and he said, there's nothing to see here, basically. Obviously, uh, we thank Lord Guy for his work and we're sorry to see him go. I think it's very important to reaffirm that this appears to be a decision connected to a very specific uh, tasking that the Prime Minister asked Lord Guy to undertake in regard to support for British industry. That is not connected in any way to uh, a personal ethics issue and I think it's important that's widely understood. Mm, although three quarters of the letter was actually about all the other stuff and not about the steel stuff. Yes. Now, this is actually not the first prime ministerial advisor on standards to resign. The previous one resigned too. It's Sir Alex Allen, and he doesn't do a lot of interviews, but because he listens to Newscast, he came and spoke to me and Vicky a little bit earlier, and it was super interesting. First of all, Sir Alex, you, you don't do a lot of interviews. So apart from this being an amazing podcast that you wanted <laughs> to be on, why, why did you feel the, the, the urge to speak out? Well, I just felt really... Uh upset that Christopher Geit, who is a very honourable man, had been put in a position where he felt he had no option but to resign. I've known him for many years and he's a, a dedicated public servant, a man with lots of integrity and um, it, it's, I mean, he wouldn't have taken this decision lightly. It's, um, I mean, it's very sad that it's come to this. Can you help decode his letter? Because it's written in a very kind of behind the scenes operator kind of way. What does he really mean? Well, I, I don't know the details, um, but I mean, it's clear that he was asked to advise on something which, as he said in his letter, would have involved a deliberate breach of the ministerial code. And he felt that put him in a what, what is he, he described as an impossible and odious position. Uh, and it was something he just couldn't live with. And, but as, as somebody who's worked in this world, that world, that word odious, I mean, that is a pretty nuclear word, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Which shows the strength of his feeling. And I think this was the final straw coming on top of, um, for example, his concerns about the fact that the prime minister hadn't um, said anything about the ministerial code in all his explanations of the Partygate saga.
Now, of course, this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, Lord Guite's predecessor resigned. That, of course, was <laughs> you. <laughs> so you have your own personal experience of working in this role. Um, did you share Lord Guite's frustration with what's been going on? Well, I mean, in my case, it was slightly different in that I um, there was a considerable investigation. The Cabinet Office did a, a lot of work and produced a very long report, which I then advised on and, and advised that it the Home Secretary had breached the ministerial code and the Prime Minister said, no, she hasn't. And um, so I felt, well, if the Prime Minister is going to reject the advice of his advisor, then there was nothing for me to do but resign. There's a bit of speculation that, that Lord Guite maybe was finding the role a bit difficult or the public scrutiny of the role a bit difficult and, and the Prime Minister in his letter to him sort of hints at that. What do you make of that? Well, I don't know. I thought he handled the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee hearing pretty well. I mean, it was obviously not easy for him, and um, it, but he played a pretty straight bat. And, 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 and as I understand it, that, that hearing wasn't the reason he resigned or pushed him over the edge. It was um, much more the combination of the um, issues around the... Um, party gate and then the aftermath of that and then this particular issue about ministers potentially at any rate deliberately breaching the code. Mm. Did you, Lord Guite, have you swapped stories over the last <laughs> few weeks and months about, well, you know, how how's it going for you? Well, I've, I've been in, in contact with him, I mean, mainly to um, offer him support. Um, uh, but, I mean, he's been grateful for, but hasn't actually needed it particularly. Um, so, um, uh, you know, and I, I've been in contact with him since he resigned to say, um, you know, I, I think you were right to stand up for your principles. How is he just doing on a personal level, not to breach your private conversations with him? But um, I, I mean, I didn't get the impression that he was, you know, f I mean, f feeling it particularly uh, I mean I think he found the, the actual issues this week quite stressful um, but um, uh, as I say I mean he he's, he's a, a man of great integrity and would have um, I mean, would inevitably have found it very difficult to, to get in a position where he had no option but to resign. Do you think Boris Johnson is a man of integrity? I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> As you say, this is because this is about the personal behaviour of the Prime Minister. That isn't something you had no, to deal with. Did. So no. this does take it to a different level, doesn't it? Which means yeah. there's more scrutiny, uh, there's more attention on, on Lord Guyton, and the person doing that. Are you surprised that we're in this position where not just once, but actually a number of times, the Prime Minister's personal behaviour is being scrutinised in this way. Well, I mean, one of the things Lord Guy has said is that it, it, how difficult it is for the uh, adviser to advise on the Prime Minister's conduct because, you know, there's a, I mean, I think he put it, there's a sort of circularity there where, um, you know, he can advise that the Prime Minister breached the code, the Prime Minister says he didn't, and therefore the, the adviser has to resign. You know, I mean, it's a, um, it's a sort of circularity which means that, for example, um, he, he, Lord Guite was didn't want to actually rule or on the issue around the breaching the law with the fixed penalty notices and ask the Prime Minister to explain, which he did in his letter back to Lord Guite, back to Lord Guite. But the public will look at this, won't they? And actually make that point. In the end, it's not an independent process. The Prime Minister is effectively yeah. marking his own homework. So the system itself is failing, isn't it? Yeah, there are real problems with the system. It isn't that easy to work out what to do. I mean, I do think it's important that the Prime Minister has the ultimate right to decide who his ministers are. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, to get in a position where, um, you know, somebody else sort of says, no, somebody must be sacked or something like that, is um, is very difficult, um, but uh, no, there are there obviously are issues, and I think one of the things that has made sense in the uh, in the latest version of the ministerial code is the the issue of graduated sanctions. So it isn't that every breach of the ministerial code automatically means a minister has to resign. There's apologies, there's suspension, there's fines and so on, which um, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, some of the things in the ministerial code, like 
I don't know, lobbying for lottery funds projects in your constituency. I mean, if you, uh, you know, if you breach that, I mean, it's hard to see that's a resignation issue necessarily. Mm. And so, um, you know, I do think that, um, it's, and, and I mean, it, 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 it seems I quite often see that the reason I resigned was because the Prime Minister wouldn't sack Priti Patel. I mean, that's not the case. Um, I mean, I put my view to the Prime Minister that the Home Secretary had breached the ministerial code. It was then up to the Prime Minister what decisions he took as a result of it. Um, and I mean, the issue for me was he rejected the advice that um, she had breached the code. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, he hadn't sacked or anything. That was entirely up to him. Do you think Priti Patel is a bully or was a bully? Well, I think that the, um, as I set out in my advice, that there, she had, in, in some of what she did, <laughs> bullied some of her staff. And um, I did also set out a lot of, you know, quite a lot of mitigating factors, like it hadn't been brought to her attention. Um, you know, there were... Um, it sort of, some. I mean, she did get frustrated sometimes with the, some of the staff in the department, um, and you know the other bit was that since it had been brought to attention, she had um, taken note of it. So uh, you know, I set out some mitigating factors, but you know, I did think actually um, the evidence was there that she had bullied some staff. There are lots of Tory MPs who say to. Adam and I, that they are worried the Prime Minister is, is tarnishing not just his own reputation, but the reputation of the Conservative Party, the government, and also actually institutions, the actual, the office, the office of Prime Minister. Are you worried that this pattern of behaviour, and we've pointed out that you resigned, now Lord Guy has resigned, that it is dragging down that office? That well, office well there, there have been quite a lot of issues. I mean, there were, for example, the original attempt to overturn the Owen Paterson rulings about the Committee on Standards rulings on Owen Paterson. You know, there have been a number of issues like that, which do um, rightly, I think, cause concern that stand, the issues around standards in public life do need to be um, reaffirmed. Is Boris Johnson capable of doing that process? Well, I'm sure he's capable of doing it. Um, it's no, whether he wants to. We'll have to see. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, Who's going to do the job next? Yeah. Are you going to offer to go back with your experience? I, I, I'm or? not going to offer to go back. Um, it's going to be hard. And I, I gather the Cabinet Office are talking about recasting the role. And, I mean, who knows exactly what they mean by that or what will emerge. Um, I think it's... I mean, clearly it took them five months to find a successor to me, find Lord Guy to su successor. Um, I, I don't know what... Um, I mean, I saw Chris Mason saying something last night that he wandered up and down Whitehall and didn't see a queue of applicants, <laughs> and I think that's probably very true. Um, the Ministerial Code, obviously, those of us in Westminster who, like... We we know bits of it off by heart, do we? No, um, we, we know what it is. We know how important it is. I just wonder if the country as a whole gets just what a key document it is. Can you just give us like a really quick summary of like why this document is so important? Well, I mean, it, it's got a long history. It grew out of, I mean, something that was just called Questions of Procedure for Ministers in, I think, 1945. But the core bit of it is, you know, the standards that are expected of ministers and... Um, and that's you know, a key thing. I mean, as you say, in my case, it was investigating an allegation of bullying. But you... shouldn't... I mean, partly some members of the public will say why do, ministers shouldn't have to be told the right way to behave. It should be pretty obvious that you don't bully people or that you uphold well, the law. Well, I mean, it should be obvious, but I think it's quite helpful to have it all set out clearly in a in a single document. Um, I but mean, you're still relying on those people to do the right thing oh, if yeah. they're found to have breached it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you have a nice bound copy, or was it just like normal printed <laughs> copy? Like I'm the rest not, of us? Well, or an online copy. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. Uh, <laughs> not. A, I'm not a great fan of printing things out. Having had a spell as the government's e envoy at one point. So. Um, you are a big fan of the Grateful Dead, though. I am. Yes, that's. <laughs> I have been. Well, I first saw them 50 years ago in right. 1972 when they toured Europe. And I've been to every that concert is... they've played in the UK since What's then. What's your favourite song? I think Ripple has to be my favourite song. OK, I'll go and listen to that, that. <laughs> on the way home. Uh, and um, there's, a, there's a myth that um, during a rail strike, you surfed to work one day. 
Yeah, well, it, well, sort of, um, in that my neighbour was uh, an evening standard. Well, he was actually freelance, but um, he did some work for the evening standard. And um, he and I were having a beer just before a rail strike and hit upon the idea that it could be fun to do this. And he got his editor to um, agree to hiring a boat. And there was absolutely no wind. And so I mean, and I had a, a bowler hat and a jacket and striped trousers, all the sort of image of what a civil servant should look like and a rolled umbrella. And um, But there was very little wind, so he had to tow me all the way to... <laughs> we were living in Putney. I had to be towed all the way to Westminster. And then I sort of sailed up and down for a bit while he took photos. And then... Um, um, this is a guy called Ken Towner, and um, I said, would you like me to jump, fall in? And he said, oh, yes, please. So we did a one, two, three, <laughs> jump. And I sort of plopped backwards into the Thames. It got quite a big splash in the evening standard, and he got a staff job as a result. So. <laughs> this is what you can do during the next real strike. Oh, on Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is perfect advice. I'm not sure. Well, I mean, the bowler hat and the moustache would go perfectly, wouldn't yeah. they? Halfway yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you very much for coming in. And it's, it's, it's a privilege to, to hear your thoughts on all of this because, as, as I was saying, you, you, don't, you don't share them that often. No, I, but um, no, I'm a huge fan of Newsnight, as I said. and um, Newscast. 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 Sorry, oh, new, oh, I'm so... Oh, 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 oh. I meant <laughs> Newscast. And, um, yeah, the first thing in the morning, I take my puppy for a walk and listen to the previous night's newscast. So it's... Um, I, and I've been a big fan ever since you were Brexit cast. So. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> if Laura Kunzberg was here, she'd want to know the name of the puppy and what kind of breed it is. It's a cockapoo called Cassie, after a Grateful Dead song called Cassidy. <laughs> wow. I and just think you and Cassie will be listening to you tomorrow morning on a walk. So I hope you're enjoying the dog walk tomorrow morning. Oh, right. Well, I'll have to see, won't I? Whether I and any potential, oh, no. and yes. any potential headlines from <laughs> this interview that the newspapers write up. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you. I mean, he looks really fed up, but when you look at that interview, when you think about Lord Guy, I mean, you joked about carrying around the ministerial code. I know you all know it off by heart. Um, but when you think about the by-elections coming up, like when I'm out and about, if I said to somebody, who's this guy, and showed a picture of Lord Guy, mm. why is he upset with, you know, people don't know. Do people care? Or how much do you think next week is going to be a real test of whether this matters to people. You know what, I've got this thing, and I have said this before on newscasts, but there's a kind of genre of Westminster story about bloke, and it often is a bloke. Yeah. Bloke you've never heard of, resigns from job you didn't know he had. Existed. But, and there is a bit of that in this, and then particularly, I was conscious of this when I was reporting this on the news last night, when you then hear from Alex Allen, who's the previous guy. But of course, step back from it all, it's about the Prime Minister's conduct, isn't it? And that's back in the headlines again, after a week where he'd kind of managed to move on to policy stuff. And it kind of roars back in. But have people started going like that? But it's, yeah, but this maybe. is, I don't know, this is maybe, it feeds into the pattern of behaviour. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, oh, people have moved on. People have moved on from all of that. And I think on that, people have moved on, but they haven't moved on and forgotten it. They've mm. made up their minds, mm. made a, a decision, and they're thinking about other things which we're going to come on to. But I, I don't think it means they've forgotten it or forgiven it necessarily. Yeah, right. Um, business journalists such as yourself have had a busy old day because interest rates have gone up to 1.25%. Yes. Which, which compared to many years before, it seems really high. Yeah, I mean, it seems high. It's the highest since it's been since 2009. It's not that high, but I think the fact that it's been incrementally going up since December says something. I remember being uh, up in Darlington just before COVID broke out and interest rates would drop to 0.1%, hoping that we'd all start spending because the economy seemed to be slowing down with this fear of this virus. Don't know whether you heard of it, mm -hmm. um, that hit in the end. Um, so at the moment, we know inflation is at 9%, predictions that it's going to go upwards of 10 11%. The idea is increase interest rates. We will look at our bank accounts and say, I don't want to spend too much because credit's expensive and I don't want to get into more debt. And if I save, I'll make a little bit more. So it slows us down from spending. But that's when we are all out spending and people who are selling stuff say we can charge a bit more because they're all buying at the moment. We're not buying at the moment. Mm. The reason inflation is high is because of scarcity of resources, gas and electricity getting higher and higher, but also the war in Ukraine. China still picking up its momentum from uh, COVID from the pandemic. And so these are things outside of our spending. We're not out there doing that. So this is a bit of a gamble, actually, because what businesses have been saying today, Make UK, for example, who represent manufacturers, are saying this is really bad timing for manufacturers. At the moment, low-cost borrowing is the last defence that we have in terms of making money, taking new people on, making new products, investing in R&D. So it's a bit of a gamble from the Bank of England. So you put interest rates up. How long does that feed in, in theory, to bring down inflation? Especially when it's point two five 
percent you know it's not significant enough for people to really feel it overnight on their mortgages for example on their credit cards and so it will only have a slow incremental effect what's happening in the meantime and this is something we've talked about a lot this week is the impact on wages so if you're in the private sector at the moment lots of businesses are looking out towards talent and saying we're going to have to offer some big bonuses we're going to you know i heard last week about graduates in the first year in a business getting ten thousand pound handshakes in order to retain them at the same wow. time Blimey. you've got public sector workers that we stood on the doorsteps and claps for mm. earning two percent increases mm. in their salaries and the chancellor's saying you know we're listening we're going to work hard for people employed by the state but at the same time we're seeing this exodus of really skilled people from the public sector because they're looking at the bank account and saying i can't cope on this salary yeah, I mean, there's loads of things to ask about that. But Chris, I just wonder with you, do you mm. feel like you've become political editor almost like in the 1970s or 80s? Because <laughs> it looks like there's loads of strikes on the horizon. Like there's a huge rail and underground one on Tuesday next week. And it's about about people not being paid enough. Exactly that. And you're seeing the political row that kicks around between the Conservatives and Labour on that. And then you've got the government wrestling with what do they do? And we've seen, haven't we, these big interventions from the from the Chancellor in the last five or six months with colossal amounts of kind of public injection of cash, but a fear from some that certainly that first one and the, and the fuel duty cut didn't really touch the sides in terms of what people noticed because prices kind of overtook it straight away. I think what we're going to get perhaps in the next couple of weeks, couple of months before the summer is the government trying, and this won't be easy, but to kind of set some sort of framework economically perhaps hearing from the prime minister and the chancellor in the next few in the next few weeks some kind of guiding principle about what it is that will drive them say between now and christmas or in the next 12 months and doing that when the two people who would write the economic policy don't always seem to be on the same page. Mm. Well, this is it, because there's rumours about tax cuts being part of that stimulation of the economy. But would that be the right answer when the public deficit is so high, you know? Um, do businesses share that critique of the government that Chris was just saying that he hears from inside the government, that there just isn't like a big kind of story about how they're managing the economy and the public finances? I think Because businesses this... like certainty, don't they? And they want to know something over the next two years, five years, ten years. I think the businesses that I've spoken to have said, have recognised the support mechanisms that were in place over COVID were really helpful, really supportive, but they feel slightly as though the net's been taken from beneath them. And the, the biggest issue facing people at the moment is vacancies. They can't get the talent in. So we heard on Tuesday that there are 1.3 million vacancies at the moment. There just aren't number, enough job actually, seekers to fill the jobs out there. And then that affects your business. So that's the problem. If you run a pub, if you run a shop and you're having to squeeze your hours, your capacity to make money isn't there. And that's their biggest concern. It's getting bums on seats. Well, Nina, thank you very much for packing your cagoule and your jumper <laughs> and your wellies and your walking how stick. Sweaty she's going to be yeah. on that train. I'm really home. sweaty driving my bag to the station, but at least the risk was reduced. You never know. There might be a bit of rain. <laughs> Do you want to borrow it for Anglesey? <laughs> I should take it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Picture ah. of the solution. I'll never one big happy family. It's a bit too fashionable for Chris. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. No, he is Mr. Cagoule. <laughs> um, and Nina, you're going to be part of a big. Um, a, the BBC is doing a whole one of these big days on Friday of just looking at an issue and it is the cost of living. Yeah, cost of living. So the, we've um, done some research talking to thousands of people about how they're feeling the squeeze. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but it's the kind of decisions they're having to take in order to make sure they can survive. And for some people, it is a case of survival. And for some people who are in full-time employment, you might have two people in the house in full-time employment really struggling to get by. And there's also a specific bit on it that looks at the impact on mental health, which has been really interesting and quite significant. Lovely to see you all. And you. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll be back very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC.